going back to the NRL 10 things, I'll change. If I ran this hypothetical, what would I do differently? Uh, is a question that I asked myself. And maybe this will help you with changes that you might want to make to your program, things you want to consider about how to get yourself to the place that you want to be as a coach or as an athlete. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have worked with the Sydney Roosters during three premierships, uh, including the 2013 season, which began the dynasty of the Roosters. Uh, In that season, it was a record-breaking season in terms of teams held to zero scoreline. And it was also, uh, we won the regular season, the the finals, you know, the grand final, the World Club Challenge, the club championship. So everything that could be won was won that year in a year where we weren't tipped to make the playoffs. Um, what part I played in that is is hard to say. You can't look back. You can't uh, know what the scenario would have been with a different strength training program, different nutrition, different speed, um, the different influences. So my component in that is only ever going to be one thing. Or at least, uh, you know, it doesn't tell you the whole picture. But what you can do is, you know, do what you believe in most as well as you can. So I'm going to share some ideas on what I would change in that future scenario if I was to take it on uh, in the near future. All right. So number one, more reverse sleds. The reverse sled is a very, very simple tool and it's a very powerful, effective one. I've seen... Some of the most athletic humans that I've ever met have been extremely fast on reverse sleds. So this would be like a test and something that I would use as a speed test. Uh, I would have players going against each other, guys in the same positions. I would use it as a conditioning tool. I would use it as a speed tool. Uh, We would be doing a lot more of them probably pre-session for quite a few guys who've had chronic issues with the knee, guys who've had surgeries before, uh, post-session for extra top-ups. And yeah, taking out a lot of the traditional running to put this in. So you can't get the same sort of metabolic stress through running that you can get through reverse sleds. So uh, backwards uphill running is probably pretty similar. It's not going to replace all your running, but of course they're going to be getting a lot of running uh, in their normal on-field conditioning work. So it's not like you're taking out all running. It's just you would take out extra supplemental running, especially for guys with specific um, issues. A lot of players have chronic issues. So more reverse sleds. I think you're going to see players running faster, stopping more easily because it builds that uh, deceleration dominance where a lot of players are acceleration dominant, which means that everything hurts or they're at risk of injury when they slow down, uh, which is not what you want. So we're going to build that deceleration dominance through the reverse sleds. Also amazing for work ethic. You cannot get the same burn in your legs uh, in any other way. Um, So yeah, so many benefits to the reverse sled and that's why we would do a lot more of them. Number two would be less ice. Okay, so you can see here some top NBA players icing everything up after games. It's a very common scene in professional sports. We know that the body is always doing its best to survive, to thrive, to repair. The body doesn't self-sabotage. And when an area becomes hot and inflamed, it's because the body is wanting to repair. Blood is the key repairer. And I knew all this while I was at the Roosters. I didn't believe in the ice. It This and you know a couple of these are quite challenging controversial because as the depending on what your role is within the organization it depends on how much you can actually influence this but i know top players at the moment with soft tissue injuries who are being told to ice their injury uh, that's going to lead to l- poorer quality tissue uh, more injury slower recovery from injury it's really you know bad news if you look at gabe merkin the the doctor who came up with this theory. He actually came out and apologized and said, look, this is uh, this is not right. Uh, I think it was about 30 years after, and that was maybe 10, 15 years ago now. Um, so you'll find a lot of people in the CrossFit scene and other scenes that will say, yeah, like the, the ice thing is done, it's finished, but still most professional athletes are using a lot of ice. So I would favor getting a lot of blood and circulation into the area. The reverse sleds are a great way to do that uh, for the lower body. Wherever the issue is, strength training on top of an injury isn't always the answer, but certainly uh, 
ice is, is also not the answer. So I think we could have a lot faster recovery and regeneration without using as much ice. Now, ice baths, um, short-term exposure is a different tool and it's used in a different way for a different outcome. We're talking about icing uh, directly here. So along a similar line, uh, moving away from non uh, an inflammatory medications, cortisone, PRP, Synvisc, et cetera, um, all of these things interfere with what's going on uh, to a large extent. There may be a case for them at, at certain times, but my preference would be to use a lot less of these. Um, again, it's not always something that you can influence, uh, usually not the decision of the strength coach. Uh, this is a medical decision, but um, depending on the structure of the club and how things are put together, it's an area that you can um, potentially influence. And for coaches and, and athletes out there, something to really consider what impact these things are having on healing processes, chronic healing, uh, and what we could do instead. I know that the PRP, for example, is meant to be a really healing intervention, but how can we get the body to naturally upregulate and send more blood to an area is really what I'm interested in. So we would also include jump balance. Now that might seem crazy for the NRL, but you know quite a few of the athletes do actually have to jump. And for those who can't and don't, um, heavier players, I would set the bar lower. Not every player would be able to do this, but that also shows where things need to be fixed. So it makes you face the problems head on rather than just kind of sweeping things under the carpet, continuing to strength train, continuing to do field sessions, but knowing that there is an underlying issue that isn't being dealt with. Now, the cool thing about the jump balance is that it will help to show us the left to right differences, discrepancies. So if a player is always stepping off the same foot or they like to accelerate off the same foot or they always jump off the same leg if they're a winger or a fullback and they're practicing a lot of you know, single leg jumps to catch balls, etc. then it's going to show up and we can deal with the challenge there. So by bringing jump balance in, it's going to make much clearer the left to right discrepancies in power exercises. Now, there's different ways that you could do this. You could do this with um, single leg hops and, you know, other sorts of tests. Um, but I think this is the way to face the issue most head on. It's the vertical displacement that is going to be most problematic for guys and that's going to help to get to the bottom of things and really um, yeah, open up new levels of athleticism by, by taking on the challenge. All right, so ATG split squats were not a part of the program in the 2013 season and they would be if I went back uh, and, and took on a team again. So the ability to really open up the hips is a key part of this. That rear hip flexor is the unspoken about benefit of the ATG split squat. People will use split squats as a preparatory exercise, but they often discount or don't value that long range uh, strength work for the hip flexor in the trail leg. That's really a huge part of this, as well as the ankle mobility there in the front leg. Now, for people that don't run, this doesn't really matter, and therefore they don't value this exercise to a high extent. For those that run, this is a better version. Uh, it's going to create more ankle mobility than just ass to grass back squats. Uh, and, and obviously getting that hip extension to the extreme is very uncommon in the weight room. And it's something that can lead to more fluid action at the hips, which has carryover to top speed, it has carryover um, to muscle activation, there's a lot of different benefits. You know, if you want to get the glutes firing, then we need to get the hip flexors lengthened. So the ATG split squat would become a focus, and not just um, not just as a mobility movement, it can definitely play its part like that, just to focus on being able to get into this position. But we we would want to get into and out of this position fast as well as heavy. And by getting to you know, you see Ben with body weight on the bar here. We'd see very, very few professional athletes with the ability to get into this position with body weight. And I do believe that we would see significant improvement in performance in knee integrity, in ankle strength, uh, ATFL, you know, the tibio tibiofibular ligament, um, anterior one, 
is going to get strained also with this movement. So anything that strains an area is going to potentially bulletproof it as well. So we want to put strain into the areas that we want to be tougher, right? So Nordics over GHD razors, right? Are we using the, the glued ham razors? We weren't using Nordics, okay? Nordics I have used in the past in programs, but without the Nordic bench, without the clear standards, partner Nordics really don't work very well. Um, most most of the time, people don't feel as though their feet are secure. There's discomfort in the ankles or the feet or something, and therefore you're not really getting the benefit that you want. Um, in the picture, you can see a six six athlete on a decline Nordic. He was able to dominate this movement on the decline, um, and was also you know throwing down phenomenal dunks like head above the rim. So uh, yeah, you don't have to be short a lot of the guys that you'll see doing well on the nordics are quite short but yeah this is a good example of someone who's tall being able to really dominate the nordic and i think you're going to see this become a staple you're going to see a lot of athletes able to really dominate uh, nordics whether the, you go into the decline or you're doing the, the cheetah floater type reps uh, there's different ways to go at it i would want to see my guys you know make that the, the new normal um that athletes are able to control down to the bottom position and work up. Um, we were doing RDLs. We were doing a lot of posterior chain work, good mornings as well, uh, variations of Olympic lifting. You're going to get that extreme length, lengthened position through the RDLs, Jefferson curls, which we were also doing as well, but the Nordic we weren't using. So this is a very specific position to improve top speed and yeah, we would have got some some significant gains out of that. Uh, so more tibialis and calf work, right? Generally, I think this kind of just gets covered off by running on the field. So the guys just get conditioned there by their running, and you know they get sore in those muscles because they're they're running hard, um, and you know it's just sort of left to itself, and that is a good solution until it's not a good solution. So it's it's rarely going to be optimal to just run and have, you know, the body kind of heal itself up because if you're developing a lot of other areas and you're developing a lot of muscle in other areas, then you create an area of weakness and then that area of weakness is susceptible uh, to injury. So in this variation, the main difficulty is sort of on the inner range. You find, I find the... The wall tibialis range to be uh, an inner range dominant tibialis exercise, which is great for activating the muscle. Um, but then I would use them more so on the slant board and you know with the tib bar to be able to really quantify this exercise and go go hard with it. Um, calves as well, put more emphasis on. We mostly just did um, some skipping and we didn't really do calf raises. And I think that uh, we could have had. Slight increase in performance, but also more resilience by doing a little bit more calf work. So I don't have an image here so much for reverse sprinting, but the backwards walking becomes backwards sprinting. Um, huge fan, all right? So if you can be explosive in that the backwards running, the research shows that you get much bigger improvement in running performance based on sprinting backwards and the transfer. Uh, you're also going to get the deceleration gains, which is really what we're looking for for professional athletes. You want to be able to accelerate, but you don't want to be able to accelerate more than you can decelerate. So the ability to stop is really what we what we want, what we're focusing on. Um, we didn't do any reverse sprinting, and I think uh, it would have been very, very interesting. I think introducing this stuff into a, into a team and to players who've had chronic issues, you'll get all sorts of things showing up. And then soon enough, you know, the body will adapt and it just becomes the normal and everybody will be doing it. But I think initially you would see huge differences between the speed guys can generate on reverse sleds or the speed they can generate uh, running backwards. And it might actually be a really good diagnostic tool to say, oh yeah, well that guy has had the, the chronic issues and look at this, he's you know 
or, you know, of, of what the team average is on this movement where maybe that doesn't show up in their top speed work. Definitely it doesn't show up in their top speed work. Like you won't see those huge discrepancies, which I think you will see when you introduce these new movements, even with tibialis and calf raises, things like that. Okay, so more Peterson step-ups would be another thing. Why would we add more Peterson step-ups? The Peterson step-up is going to load the ACL. It's actually recreating the kind of forces and tension that snaps the ACL. Uh, it's recreating the mechanism. Therefore, by putting stress pressure on that ligament, I think you're going to see increased strength, tensile strength in that ligament. Anything that's put in a cast, anything that's not loaded, we know in the body is going to decondition and it's going to become more susceptible to injury. So the opposite of that is to train it, is to develop it. Put load into it, progress that load, and then progress the speed with which that load can be handled, and good things will happen. So the Peterson is the most proven ACL preventer uh, according to the, the Poliquin method and Peterson himself, the statistics with the Canadian um, skiers and winter Olympic sports, downhill skiers. They got phenomenal results with this. Together with the Nordic, the Nordic you know, pulls from the back and then you know, having a super strong VMO also helps to support. Um, so that's the variation here on the right for those who are watching uh, the slideshow. So clear targets is the next thing. Uh, we can be very, very clear about what numbers need to be achieved here. And we can identify in the matrix of the ATG system where the strengths are and where the weaknesses are. And if an athlete can see that and have that laid out in front of them and say, look, there's, there's, this is where the biggest potential uh, areas for failure are, the biggest possible weaknesses, we know where to put increased training volume. And if you can be really coherent and clear with this with athletes, but also with coaching staff, if you can say, look, you know, this guy has been in and out for years. This is what his numbers are showing. Like he's this much down compared to the rest of the squad compared to where we want him to be, is this much down? Can we have two weeks to focus on improving this? Can we have a month? Can I, can, I, can we make it an effort to, to train over the Christmas period on these two movements so that that um, issue can be, can, you know, be eradicated? I definitely didn't have this dexterity as a coach, um, understanding exactly where players sit in this matrix. We did have a lot of numbers and I could see, you know, where the strengths were, where the weaknesses were. And there've been, there's been a lot of money invested in these sorts of systems. I've seen systems from different coaches with the spider plots and all these things and they're great. And often they look really good, but the devil's in the details and the details that matter in this are whether it's on a ground up, you know, whether the philosophy underpinning the, the scores is going to actually improve performance. Like that's really uh, what we need to know. So just by measuring things doesn't help. You know, you can measure, okay, what are their bicep curls and what are their tricep extensions and, you know, how, how strong are their glutes? But if they're not built right from the ground up, then it doesn't matter what your numbers are and you can't deduce anything from the scores about how fast they're going to run or how resilient they're going to be. And I think it's particularly this area of resilience. Like the number one thing in a program is to decrease injuries. If you can have your players on the field, you lose, use the least number of players for the season, you have players consistently training, like that is the biggest thing. Uh, they talk about superheroes, all right? So the superhero that's the last man standing, the hardest to defeat in superheroes. I was listening to Michael Saylor talking about this in relation to money, in relation to engineering, in relation to Bitcoin. But the thing that can't be broken, the superhero that can't be damaged is actually the, the most valuable one, right? So eventually the one who has the defense mechanism will be the winner because they can't be touched. So that's the most, the biggest superpower to have. And I've seen athletes make their career out of being extremely reliable, resilient. They play week in, week out. That is the number one thing that we want to do here, right? So players are already coming with a lot of talent. Our goal is to upgrade the hardware and make them connective tissue dominant so that they can continue to play, right? So our targets and our 
A2G performance matrix has to tell us whether the athlete is connective tissue dominant or is extremely muscle dominant and therefore at high risk. We have to know where the areas of weakness are and to be able to quantify the level of you know, tendon connective tissue weakness relative to muscle weakness. So this would be the real goal aim matrix, you know, that I would share with the player and with the coach. So everything is really clear. And then over time, that data will obviously get better. ATG is still you know, in its infancy. And these kind of matrix have been used for a long time, but not with these sorts of numbers. So the numbers is really what make all the difference, the movements that are selected and the quality criteria around the movements. So I think this is where we're going to see a huge change in elite sports, and that's what I'm really excited about. So I have had the opportunity to implement this system uh, for a month with Sonny Bill Williams. The results from that program were phenomenal. Uh, he said that it was the best he's run in years. I also ran the best I'd run in years. We had other players who were at the event who also were very, very excited about the changes that they felt in their body in a short period of time. You really can get a significant change in a short period of time. Often the underpinnings are there with high-level athletes. Uh, it's just the right areas aren't being challenged in the right ways to optimize uh, movement. So it's, yeah, you can get a significant shift in a short period of time. And we did see that at that camp. Now, there were other factors involved in what happened after that. You know, Sonny didn't really get to express a lot of that, but he did end up, you know, finishing his career back at the Roosters um, where, yeah, no one can know whether he would have done that, you know. Um, and we did do some preparation also for the World Cup and we applied some of this philosophy uh, when Sonny was in doubt for the World Cup. I went over there um, to work with him when he was concerned that he wasn't going to make the World Cup. Uh, had 10 days over there and we did some work on, on things. We did some things that are different to what's done conventionally. He did end up going to that World Cup uh, and he signed the biggest contract in history uh, shortly after that uh, to play with the Toronto Wolfpack. I don't know what role I played in any of that. All I know is that I did my best and that we did things that most teams, most clubs, most trainers uh, are not doing. My feeling is that it was it was the good stuff and it really made a massive positive difference. I know it did for myself. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I, do, I don't know whether I will ever go back and work full-time in professionally in a team. Uh, it's probably pretty unlikely at this stage with uh, the way things are going in the world and the way things are going in my own business and life. But I do still you know, really, really love uh, seeing professional athletes thrive. And I do think we can do these things better. I know sometimes... It can be construed like people sometimes think I'm, I'm really negative um, by you know criticizing the way things are done and other systems. But I mean, that's the only way that we get to the next level is to look critically at what's going on and, and look for what's coming next. So I'm mostly focusing here on criticizing what I did in the past. Um, I'm not talking that much about what I actually did, but I'm sharing some of what I didn't do. And you know, I, I think that there is a lot of value in that if we look back at what we've done and say, yeah, this could have been done better. You know, that's it's 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 positive, and you know, can have a real uh, important output, um, important impact on on the future. So, I'm going to do another one of these, uh, diving more into the underpinning uh, philosophies and checklist, I guess, for coaches to know if they're putting together a good program or if they're putting together a program which is likely to result in, in more injuries. Uh, coaches are doing their best. And I think what we need to do is just upgrade our philosophy and the matrix of understanding of what makes a great program. So if you'd like to uh, see that series, or if there's another question that you'd love to hear answered, please drop me some thoughts, your biggest take home from today, which one out of these 10 is the huge focus for you at the moment or what's changed recently. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear from you. So we'll chat soon.